Welcome back to Case Closed with former Attorney General John Swallow. John, how are we doing today? I'm doing great, thanks. John, thank you so much for letting me be on the show. Thank you so much for indulging in all of my questions and being able to talk through these kind of tough and complicated situations and questions and being able to explain that to not only me, but to our audience that has so many of these of these questions that they, they need answers to. You bet, it's my pleasure. And boy, nothing nothing is more important, I think, for, than for people to understand that you know, if they've got a challenge, a legal cha challenge, they have legal rights. That's why we are doing this podcast, so that people are educated and informed and can make good decisions. Amazing. Uh, today we have an awesome topic that I think we are gonna have a lot of fun with, and it's gonna be talking about personal injury cases. And I know that you have a million and one experiences and stories in this world. But before we jump into that, what constitutes as a personal injury in law? Right. So, so first of all, um, it's important um, that we recognize that an injury can be like 100% life disruptive. Let's, let's, take, let's take an athlete who... Um, is in a, in a motorcycle accident, uh, driving down the highway, goes through an intersection, someone r runs a, a light and hits them or doesn't see them, and it changes their career. They're no longer headed to the NFL, right? They're, they're now in a wheelchair, or they, they've blown out a knee and, and can't get back to where they were. And so it can be life-changing, life-devastating, whether you're an athlete or whether you're just a regular person who likes to go on long hikes or walks or do whatever you like to do. So. Personal injury is important, and a personal injury is just like it sounds. It, um, it's where you get hurt through someone else's fault, someone else's negligence, someone, someone doing something that they shouldn't have done or not doing something that they should have done, like shovel the snow on their sidewalk, and it causes someone to slip and fall. Um, not watching carefully um, when someone gets on a ski lift and they get knocked off the lift and they get hurt because of that. They've the, the, the operator should have been more careful and didn't and therefore caused an accident. And that's called negligence. So when there is an injury caused by someone's negligence, then there, then there has, a, then a claim arises, which we call personal injury. That was amazing. So if, if I'm over at a friend's house and I'm helping them move and I trip up their stairs or down their stairs, is that still in the realm of personal personal injury that can bring in legal action? Well, it depends on the fault of the homeowner. So if the carpet was sticking up in some way and hadn't been tacked down properly, then you could argue that there was a duty of the homeowner to take care of that carpet and not cause the accident. And so the homeowner's insurance would cover a claim and investigate whether that would be um, recoverable under the insurance policy. One, people, one, one thing that people don't understand, I know this is a little different from the question, is that every person who owns a home, almost without exception, owns an insurance policy on the home that protects the homeowner from a claim. And so many people will say, oh, that's my neighbor's house. Um, for example, uh, many years ago, when my oldest daughter was probably 12, she had a friend over at our house and we had a north facing house, which means that the sun didn't hit it in the winter time. And so there was I always ice on our stairs. And sometimes I was really on top of it with like snow melt and other times I wasn't. Well, one day her friend ran out the front door. They were, they were kind of horsing around in our house, ran out the front door and hit the steps, slipped, fell, landed on her elbow and broke it. Now, the, the family her family didn't end up making a claim against our insurance, but they certainly could have. And my insurance company would have covered it and it wouldn't have hurt us as homeowners at all. So, so if there is an injury caused by someone's failure to keep the driveway clear or the steps clear, it's really a simple matter to find out the insurance information and it won't hurt your neighbor like you think it might. And if, like in our case, we welcome, we even told the family, go ahead and make a claim. And they wouldn't, but we certainly felt like if they did, it would be the right thing for them to do so they could get the medical bills taken care of. And if there's any kind of pain and suffering caused by that, you know, missed opportunities, that my daughter's friend could have received a recovery right from the insurance company. Gotcha. So 
it just kind of all depends. It depends on the fault. It depends just all in that world on what claim that you can actually file, correct? Right, and people need to know that there is insurance that covers the negligence of a homeowner on their home. Perfect. Well, let's, let's give the people a couple more examples on the different types of personal injuries that need legal action. Could you list a couple of them and just maybe just a couple little examples of what those might look like? Sure. Well, right now I'm defending someone, um, a client of mine who owned a dog who actually bit someone tragedy. Uh, no one died from it, but certainly there was, there are going to be some scarring because of it. So I'm defending a dog bite. So uh, under Utah law, there's a strict liability statute, which means that there's no defense. If you own a dog and your dog hurts someone, injures somebody, bites somebody, then there is negligence established and liability established on the owner of the dog. And so a dog bite, uh, a slip and fall, like we talked about, trip and fall, right? Um, a car accident, if someone runs a stoplight or is intoxicated, you know, drunk when they're driving a car and uh, causes an accident. Um, medical procedures. It's very complicated to, to um, litigate a medical malpractice case. And there are lots of hoops to jump through under state law, especially in my home state of Utah. But if you are injured by a doctor's negligence, if they do something wrong, and you've heard, all heard the stories about the doctor sewing up someone and leaving the scissors inside of the person or something. Um, some, you've heard the stories about them amputating the wrong leg um, those kinds of things where there's malpractice, you can actually make a claim against a doctor. So the, you know, as, as many ways as you can get injured, there is what's called a personal injury claim potential. And then based on the facts, you can actually make a claim and receive compensation for your injury. So that kind of opens the world up to people. Cause I feel like a lot of people, either they accidentally get hurt somewhere or they, they just kind of don't know where to go with their injury. You're saying, it gives them a chance. It gives them the hope. Like if, if there's an injury under the sun that's happened before, there's probably a claim that can be discussed or a situation that can kind of be further explained to them. Well, the way things are set up right now, um, almost anybody can talk to a lawyer, um, get advice about the circumstances and find out if they have a good, a valid claim. For, for a personal injury claim on an insurance policy. So my advice is, is that if you've been injured and you think it's through anyone else's fault, that you should talk to a professional, talk to a lawyer, and and get it, get professional information about whether or not you have a valid claim, and then work with that lawyer to uh, prosecute that claim against the, apply for that claim like, with the insurance company. It just makes sense. It's just the thing that you should do. Um, because if 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 people are causing injuries, they should be responsible for the injuries that they cause. And because insurance comes into the to this the equation almost all the time, it's not like you're taking food off the plate of your neighbor to do that. And certainly you can do that in the right way. You can you can even talk to your neighbor and say, "Look, my daughter was visiting your home. She tripped and fell, and there was a nail exposed out of the, out of the." stud this is actually a case i've worked on and uh, the nail shouldn't have been there and because of that there's going to be a scar and we're going to talk to your insurance company about that and we hope this doesn't hurt you at all but we feel like we need to help my daughter get the plastic surgery she needs to receive or whatever it is to protect herself going forward and so that's that's something that people may not think about or may hesitate to think about and there are always ways always there are ways to talk to your neighbor and make sure that that uh, they understand that you're not trying to hurt them, but you are trying to make it right for your family member or for yourself if you're injured through the negligence of someone who was insured. I love how we're just trying to, all the kind of, kind of lessons and advice you give is just always trying to make things right and always just trying to make things fair with people and make sure people are taken care of. You know, I believe in the inherent good nature and goodwill of people the inherent goodness of people, but they need to be informed. Can I throw a scenario your way of a, a person I know? They were at a bowling alley, they were playing, they did all that, but they actually slipped and broke their elbow. Can you kind of talk me through like what a process, like any process like that, they're at a business instead of somebody's house, like what is the first step 
if they're going to file a claim in their personal injury? Like, what does that look like kind of step by step if that was someone that came to you? Well, the, the scenario you gave, um, you can't really, without investigating, understand whether that would rise to the level of negligence on the part of the bowling alley, right? So I think the first thing to do if you, if you do hurt yourself somewhere, uh, you think that maybe there was something, uh, when you hurt yourself, you wanna take care of yourself, right? And the th second thing you wanna do is report it quickly, r right there in the moment. So I, I, I have a, a person, I wouldn't necessarily call them a client, um, who tripped on an elevated piece of metal that was on the floor of a shop, shopping center that should have been you know, put back level with the floor and it was sticking up about an inch. She tripped, fell, flew through the air, landed on a grocery cart and, and had some discomfort in her neck and her, and her back and bruising because of it. So the question would become whether the store owner was negligent in having that piece of metal sticking out of the floor. And I think there's a good argument to be made that there was negligence there. So she immediately contacted the store manager, immediately described what happened, and, and put them on notice that there was an injury that had just occurred at their place. The reason it's important to let people know right away that there's a problem is so that they, you remove the element of, oh yeah, three weeks ago, you know, I tripped and fell at the store, and that removes an element of, you know, make-believe, right? That this didn't really happen, and it, and it just provides some instantaneous, contemporaneous reporting for an instantaneous accident where there are witnesses around, where, where people at the store may have seen what had happened, right, and could, and, and could confirm that there actually was someone who flew through the air and landed in a grocery cart. And so that really is important. So contact the owner right away, um, try to get their insurance information right away, and then do anything you can to uh, confirm what happened by talking to witnesses, get witnesses' names and phone numbers, getting statements. I know it sounds like a lot of work, but you're trying to build a case that you're not, you're not making this up, that this, something really happened, right? Um, if there's bruising, take pictures of bruises. If there's a broken arm, you know, make sure you document that when you go to the, the doctor. If you're in an auto accident, you and, and there's any kind of an injury at all, car or to yourself, you probably want to call the police and get a police report. Um, I have people all the time who, because they have a police report and the, and the investigating officer made a determination of who they thought was at fault, it, it really protects the claimant, the person who has been injured from the other side saying, oh, no, 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 it wasn't my fault. It was actually her fault. And if, if you call the police and there's a police report that really designates who's at fault and, and it's the other party that that can become evidence later on in a, in a dispute, in a case, a lawsuit or in a claim about who is responsible for the injury. Gotcha. So when, if you get injured or if you get injured and you know there's some, there's another party potentially at fault, who do you, so you go to like, if, if you get hurt at a grocery store, you go to the store manager, would you call the police in that scenario? Like how, how can you go into more detail on like how you gather the evidence? Like, where do you put it? Who do you, who do you give it to? Like, cause you don't have a lawyer just right there. Well, maybe you do, <laughs> but where, how do you collect it? And then who, who, who is the person you give it to or contact? Well, police will usually respond to an auto accident. Um, but in a grocery store or something, you simply would report it to, um, again, I'm not trying to give legal advice here. I don't represent you, but um, if we're retained, then that's a different story. Uh, but just make sure someone knows, and you're using your, your common sense about um, letting someone know that there something, an incident happened, asking if someone saw it. I mean, look around and say, did you see that? Yeah, I saw that, but you fell. Do you mind if I get your name and your phone number? Right. And then, and then, and then contact a store manager and say, I just slipped and fell. This person over here saw it happened. You know, there was, there was a, a bottle of water that had been spilled on the floor and I slipped on it, didn't see it. And I'd like to, I'd like to know what your insurance information is. And I'd like to just let you know something happened and I'll be in touch. I'm going to head off to the hospital and take care of my sprained ankle. Um, but you've made a record right then of what happened. You've let someone responsible know. And, and you've gotten you've gotten the name of the manager, the phone number of the manager, the name of the witness, 
and then go take care of yourself and then you have time to talk to a lawyer if you feel like you need to and start the clean process. So when you're prepared, just like you've talked about a million times before and you'll always talk about it, when you're prepared for these scenarios, it's gonna help you in the long run, especially. When you when you put in your own effort at the very beginning, making sure that you, that you write everything down, grab the evidence, talk to who you need to talk to, it's a lot easier when you have all that now instead of maybe a month or two down the line if it's brought to a lawsuit or something it's, it's a little bit easier to to kind of cover your kind of cover your behind well yeah and, and it's just common sense yep. um anything you can do to document what's happened will help you down the road with your credibility and and convince people that you're not just making things up and so i ask clients to take a picture um, if they've had severe injuries in a car accident Take pictures, take pictures of the bruising, keep a journal, keep a record, talk about each day how you feel and what you went through and, t and keep a record of what you can't do and what you'd like to do and what opportunities you've missed. And, and it, it, if you keep a, a journal talking about those kinds of things, then six months later, you remember all the details and you can present that in, tr in a negotiation with the insurance company or insurance. Your attorney will have more information than with an attorney, more is always better because then they can look at all the information you've gathered and make a good decision about whether or not your injury um, it, it was caused by a certain circumstance or whether um, you, you um, don't have a valid claim or the intensity of the injury and the amount that you might seek in recovery. Again, to put you as close as possible back to a whole position, the position you were in before the injury occurred through someone else's negligence. Gotcha. Thank you, John. Um, kind of switching a little gears just to answer a question that I have is, does the amount of insurance you have matter or the amount of insurance somebody else, does that matter in kind of the long run or does that matter in these particular scenarios? Well, it's important to understand, and, and I appreciate you asking that question, is that um, insurance companies generally will insure a loss up to the amount, the maximum amount of the policy in place. So I've seen situations where someone was actually killed in an auto accident and only had minimum coverage on their own vehicle, which typically is $25,000. And then they have, every policy will normally have under state law an underinsured or an under, uninsured portion where if the other, the other car is underinsured, which means that the damages caused by the accident are greater than the policy limits of the insurance company. So they're underinsured or they're, or the other side just doesn't have insurance at all. It's uninsured policy. So in your policy that you buy, you, you can pay for coverage, 25,000, 50,000, 100,000, 250,000, $500,000 for an accident that your insurance company would pay for, right? Per, per incident. The other side will have the same type of, you know, coverages. And if they've only, if you've only taken the minimum of 25 and they've only taken 25, the maximum you could ever recover from the insurance is $50,000. And that not, might not be enough to compensate you for losing a spouse or a child or an arm or a leg or something horrible, a brain injury in an accident. So the more insurance you can buy for yourself, it's usually pretty inexpensive to do that up, up those limits. The more you're paying yourself if you're injured and the other person who's at fault doesn't have enough coverage. So in the situation where this person was killed through someone else's negligence, they ran, a, they ran over my, my client's husband, the widow got $50,000. But if she'd had $100,000 in her own policy and $100,000 of underinsured or uninsured coverage, the widow would have received $200,000 for the loss of her husband instead of 50. And so that's, that's how the insurance works. And so it's important for people to understand that the amount of coverage they have for underinsured or uninsured and for their own coverage really is about what, what they're able to recover if someone else hurts them, and that's real. Now, sometimes the other side is like a commercial carrier, which has a $2 million policy limit. 
but you can't always decide who's going to hit you in an accident, who's going to cause your problem. So it's good to have as much coverage as you can afford. And again, increasing those coverage uh, limits is not that expensive. It can end up costing you just a few dollars a month extra in coverage to have the peace of mind knowing that if you're hit by someone else who's not insured or underinsured, you're still going to recover more than if you weren't paying attention to that very important detail. And after the injury happens, it's too late to increase your coverage for that injury. So you got to do it on the front end. And I would advise anybody uh, to look at your policy and make sure you're getting all the coverage you can afford to just protect yourself from someone else not being insured if they hurt you. Because you never know. You never know when something like that is going to happen to your family. And I, I love that advice that you give just to just like, again, just be prepared, make sure that you have all of your bases covered and kind of going kind of back to personal injury and the lawsuit side of things. Let's say that I'm going skiing and one of the, maybe one of the courses aren't as developed or they're not being taken care of and I accidentally hurt myself and it's the other, it's the, it's the ski resort's fault. When I have that claim and I bring it to a lawyer, bring it to a firm, are there some firms that like are better equipped for lawsuits? Are there other ones that just try to stay away from it? What, what has been kind of your experience there? Well, getting back to your example about skiing, skiing is a very different creature because most states who have, that have ski resorts in them have um, protections that uh, define skiing as an inherently dangerous activity and really protects ski resorts from those types of lawsuits, just for what it's gotcha. worth. So check with a lawyer in your state, make sure that you understand what your rights are if you're hurt in a, in a skiing activity, right? Uh, but yes, your question about some, loss, some law firms are more inclined to settle, and some people call them settlement mills, and another lawsuit, l other law firms are more than willing to do whatever it takes to get you a good recovery. And they're willing to, to and, they're, and they've got lawyers that are very good at trial work and are willing to go all the way to a jury to get you the result that you're looking for. That's where I think it's important that you investigate and understand who your lawyer is, ask the hard questions, and, and really make an independent judgment about the right lawyer for you. And, and I can tell you as a person who's represented a lot of clients, and even a person who's actually had to engage a lawyer on occasion for my own issues, that the lawyer matters. And you can tell pretty quickly if the lawyer you're dealing with is really right for you. And don't be, don't be afraid to make hard decisions if you feel like you're not being represented by <clears throat> the right lawyer the right way. But also keep in mind that when you sign a contingency agreement, um, you may be signing away um, some, of your, some of your fees even if you replace your lawyer with a different lawyer. So you have to really, as you go into that relationship, be smart, read carefully, ask questions, and then make a good decision as you engage an attorney to represent you professionally. So kind of make sure you know who you're, who you're working with, who's the most professional, going back to your example about finding the right doctor for the right ailment or for the right broken bone, just trying to really cover, cover your bases when it comes to that. Right. And if you're careful, and if you read the agreement, if you ask questions, then you can own your decision. You can be responsible for the decisions that you make um, and ask around. I mean, the, the decision to hire a lawyer is a very important decision and you, it's not one you make every single day. So get it right if you can. Perfect. Kind of going along with that question and kind of rolling into our last question is what's the difference between a formal lawsuit and an informal settlement? when you're looking at these personal injury cases. Right, so um, when you make a claim against an insurance company, you're not starting a lawsuit per se. But you can begin to work, or your lawyer can begin to work with the insurance company to try to see where, where the company's coming from. And, and for example, if, if you've got, and this may be a little complicated, so I'll try to keep it real simple. If you look at your insurance coverage and the insurance coverage of the person who's hurt you, like in a car accident, and they have a low limit of liability, say their liability cuts off at $50,000, 
and you've got a real major inj injury, a broken leg, a broken arm, um, you know, a concussion and a brain injury, the insurance company can pretty quickly decide that this is a policy limits case and just offer you the whole amount of the policy and you're done with them. And so in that type of case, you may not even need an attorney if it's a really serious injury and a fairly low um, policy limit, it's called, right? It's where you've got a pretty high limit in a pretty devastating injury where if you if you're not careful you may be tempted to settle without the lawsuit and you may settle for less than the claim is worth so if you're dealing informally with the company or through your attorney with the company and you feel like you can work it out for some reason and not go to a lawsuit level that's the informal process. The formal process is when you actually decide, your lawyer decides with you that you need to file a lawsuit and let a judge decide or an arbitrator decide what the result ought to be. That's where it's more formal. And so if that answers your question, there's an informal process between you and your attorney and the insurance company and the formal process with the lawsuit and the judge or an arbitrator making the decision for you. So that's, that's the difference between the two. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for answering that question. And thank you for being able to take kind of a deeper dive into the, the personal injury lawsuits, claims into that world. Uh, is there any other kind of advice you'd give to someone that might be in the middle of these cases or might have not collected enough evidence? Is there anything that you'd kind of just let someone know to help them get through the process a little bit easier? Well, sure. First of all, an injury is never anticipated and it's always devastating and sometimes more so than others, right? Um, it's rare that it happens to you. And so a lot of people aren't going to have a lot of experience finding a lawyer, the right lawyer for them, knowing who to trust. But it's one of those life events that requires a lot of thought and a, and, and a lot of attention and choosing the right help. And so I encourage anybody who has been seriously injured to find a lawyer they can trust, to talk to neighbors and friends or, or try to, to determine who they can really you know, rely on in that very important time in their life, which is very, very rare, so that their rights are protected, they understand what their rights are, and that they can be treated fairly um, for the consequences of someone else's bad acts or negligent acts. Amazing. Thank you again, John, for inspiring us and also teaching us all of these little secrets that aren't always out there or aren't always easily accessible. And yet again, if any of you do have questions, please feel free to go to askjohnswallow.com. They have a whole, a, whole, a whole team that is willing to answer some of these questions. Great. We, we do invite you to, to if, you, if you don't know who to talk to, let us know and We'll see what we can do to help. AskJohnSwallow.com.